Well, for years now, elements of the permanent political class, the legacy media, the so-called civic leaders have tried to upend what we the people have universally accepted as American values and principles really ever since our founding. You know the ones, the truths we hold to be self-evident, all that stuff. Well, the nuclear family, the value of hard work, the role of the military as a lethal fighting force as opposed to an incubator for progressive ideologies, things as fundamental as the freedom of speech and religion, the right to bear arms, Judeo-Christian ethics, showing up for work on time, the Socratic method, even the national anthem, these things have all become highly politicized and controversial. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have been cheerleading this from inside the White House. The result, of course, is we are more divided today than we were a year ago at a time when we should be rallying around the flag. Joe Biden is giving his State of the Union address next week in Washington, and he's facing a tough audience, the American public. Vladimir Putin has managed to worm his way into the poll position when it comes to President Biden's current priorities. And what can the president say to reassure us next week? Well, the commander in chief is almost 20 points underwater on this issue, according to the latest Gallup presidential tracking poll. Just 36% of Americans approve of Joe Biden's handling of the Ukraine crisis, 55% disapprove. Overall, just 41% approve of Joe Biden as president. And again, 55% disapprove over everything he's doing. Now, it's only taken us a year to get here, to sink to these depths. And do you remember when Joe Biden was boasting that America was back? Diplomacy is back. America is back. And you see what he wrote there. As vice president, I work closely with America's Democratic partners to advance our shared vision and values as president. I'll work with our partners and allies to defeat COVID-19 and advance peace and shared prosperity around the world. So those shared values, what are they? Now, we've come a long way, of course, but of course, we're moving in the wrong direction. Biden, who's been a moderate for most of his 50 years in Washington, promised to bring us together as president. But as it turns out, he's not that guy. The Atlantic last year heralded the arrival of the new progressive era of which Biden was the protagonist. The mass suspending at the onset of the new administration was enough to even make Bernie Sanders happy, the article boasted. The so social justice warriors were on the march. The military was examining white rage. And then you can flash forward to today. The Wall Street Journal says we've entered a new Cold War with Russia. Or is it World War III when you consider China's designs on Taiwan? It's hard to keep all these crises in context. Of course, the ramifications are massive. We must unite as a country against these threats to win. We absolutely must. But we wonder if we can with this administration. You may have heard the president last week, the vice president as well, the White House press secretary, all talking about these shared sacrifices we're going to have to make to stand up to Vladimir Putin. Higher gas prices, more supply chain issues. You're already feeling it. Why does that matter to the American people? That should matter because that is a fundamental value that we as a country stand up for and we stand up against that type of action. That goes back to World War II. When the president spoke to the American people last week, it was very important to him to be very direct and clear and straightforward with them about what this could mean uh, as we looked to what the impact of an invasion could mean uh, and also what the impact of sanctions could mean and the fact that standing up for values uh, is not without cost. Uh, this is about standing up for American values and making, and he wanted to make clear to them what impact that could have. And here's the vice president last week in Europe also talking about shared sacrifice. When America stands for her principles and all of the things that we hold dear, um, it requires sometimes for, for us to put ourselves out there in a way that maybe we will incur some cost. And in this situation um, that may relate to energy costs, for example. So they want to talk about costs. So soon after we saw 13 young Americans pay the ultimate price, the ultimate cost for their failed leadership in Afghanistan. Come on, man. Now, the problem for the Biden administration is not that Americans are unwilling to sacrifice something to stand up to Putin or any other despot. The problem is so many people are unwilling to stand up for this administration because we don't want to stand up for what they consider American values and principles. Over burdensome COVID mandates, uh, the control, the out of control government spending we saw followed by the predictable inflation, separating parents from kids in the classroom, cashless bail for violent criminals, the Green New Deal. And let's not forget about those sweetheart deals with Ukrainian and Chinese companies for the president's son. The list goes on and on. Is that what we're sacrificing for? 
Now, if the White House is going to try to sell us on the idea that we need to sacrifice more for their domestic and foreign policy missteps, they must do a better job of redefining what those values and principles are that they share with the rest of America, the majority of America who disapprove of how they are governing. All right, let's talk about all this more and more with Newsmax contributor Fred Flight. He's also the vice chair of the America First Policy Institute for American Security. Also with us, Gordon Chang, the author of the great U.S.-China tech war and the coming collapse of China. Great to have you both with us. Thanks, John. All right, so I want to focus on these sanctions, Fred, that have been imposed so far. Some people say they're a little soft. What do you say? Well, they do seem fairly soft, and that's been the reaction of a number of economists and business experts I've seen. And when you look at this, John, we have an American president who drew a red line and said to Vladimir Putin, if you cross it, there'll be the toughest sanctions ever. Putin crossed the line. There weren't the toughest sanctions ever. And there was actually confusion in the White House over whether this was an incursion that merited severe sanctions. And I, I think that Biden has gone from a a weak and incoherent position and simply made this worse in the aftermath of, of, of Putin's actions. And I think this is simply going to encourage Putin to move his troops into the Donbass and maybe further into Ukraine. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, you hear a lot of cheerleading from the legacy media and from Democrats talking about how closely aligned Europe is now with Biden. But that isn't because of this administration, Fred. It's because of what Vladimir Putin has done uh, he may have bitten off more than he can chew here based on the European response. I agree with you, but that isn't even true. I mean, the Germans temporarily shut down uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. There were no energy sanctions because the Europeans wouldn't agree to that. The economic sanctions were not nearly as tough as, as they might have been. And I mean, we've seen separate efforts by the French and the British to meet with Putin. So this is sort of a a a, a, a media mirage mm -hmm. they're pushing to try to to, to buck Biden up. I, I just don't buy it. Yeah, some of the questions uh, yesterday in the press briefing were a little bit over the top in terms of, you know, covering for this administration. Now, Gordon, I want to focus on what President Trump says is going to happen next. Here's the former president. By the way, China's going to be next. You know, China's going to... You think they're going to go after Taiwan? Oh, absolutely. Not with me, they wouldn't have. But you uh, think with Biden, they'll oh, try yeah, him. they're waiting until after the Olympics. Now the Olympics ended and uh, look at your stopwatch, right? No, he's uh, he wants that just like it's almost like twin sisters right here because you have one that wanted that wants Taiwan. I think equally badly. Somebody said, who wants it more? I think probably equally badly. So, Gordon, is, is it just a matter of time before China takes Taiwan? I think that there are ways that we can deter China, but the Biden administration is not taking them. And as for waiting for the end of the Olympics, it was on February 5 that China flew its Y-12 utility plane directly over a Taiwan island. That's the first time in more than 40 years where China has done that. And of course, that's an act of war. Um, so we're going to see more and more pressure on Taiwan. And I think it's going to depend on whether Xi Jinping thinks he's going to get pushback from the White House. And so far, we have seen these propaganda messages from China beginning in March of last year, about how the U.S. cannot deter China, how the U.S. is incapable, how the U.S. cannot win a war anymore. And this is really frightening, John, because it shows that the Chinese mentality, and I'm not saying the Chinese mentality is correct, but it shows that the Chinese mentality is that they can do anything they want. So we wait and we watch to see what happens with Taiwan. I also want to stay on this topic of, of China because we just saw NBC recorded its lowest ratings ever for the Olympic Games, a collapse of 36 percent compared to 2018. And I think this proves, and I'm somewhat optimistic, maybe Pollyannish here, Fred, but it proves Americans still don't like slavery. They don't like genocide. I think it also tells us that broadcasters and sponsors cannot necessarily associate themselves with a murderous Chinese regime anymore and still hope to, you know, make profits as they once did in this country. I think American, it, America's finally awoken to what's actually happening in China. It's really a credit to the American people that they ignored the ads on NBC and the endorsements by, by media celebrities and tuned out. They didn't watch the games because they did look at these as genocide games. They heard what's happening with the Uyghurs. Uh, they listened to people like Enos Cantor, uh, Cantor Freedom on, on, on how we really need to step up uh, against what's going to happen in China. I think this sent a, a message to the media world and to the corporate world that 
I, I think the American people, their, their, their patience is running out with this effort to cover for the Chinese Communist Party. But I have a feeling that Gordon Chang has even stronger thoughts on this. Yeah, we'll let Gordon fill in the blanks here. You know, John and Fred, I was actually stunned that people didn't watch the Winter Olympics. Now, I didn't watch it out of principle, um, but I thought that because of the genocide, because of the brutality, and because it was China, that people would just be interested. But, you know, as Fred pointed out, no, the American people have tuned out. And, and that really is an indication that the American people understand the nature of the challenge from China, how vicious it is, and they don't want a part of it. And it shows you American values have held intact. Unfortunately, those American values are not shared by our political class. Yeah. They're not shared by Wall Street. They're not shared by boardrooms. But the American people are there. And by the way, John and Fred, we get to vote in November. There's always that, and the Chinese don't have that luxury of, of democracy. And it also reminds me of a famous Winston Churchill quote that Americans always do the right thing after trying all the wrong things first. Fred Gordon, great to see you both. Thanks so much. Good to be here.